Where do we go from here when our lives have been forever changed? When we've lost so much and yet so much more is at stake. As we work to heal as a nation and rebuild community, it's imperative that we take a moment to pause, reflect, reach back and reconnect. Let the circle be unbroken. We share a sacred trust with those who have gone before and with those who will come after. We share a sacred trust of those who have gone before us, those upon whose shoulders we stand. We acknowledge their love and sacrifice. Those most ancient ancestors who built the first civilizations who constructed the pyramids to Akhenaten and Queen Taye, we say in Saab, which means come and drink, to those ancestors who throughout our history have fought for liberation, both on the continent of Africa and throughout the diaspora, to Patrice Lumumba, Toussaint L'Overture, Queen Nzinga, Steve Biko, Mother Fanny Lou Hamer, we say inside. To those who have succumbed to the bitter fruit of white supremacy in the form of police brutality. Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, we say inside. To those who have died from COVID-19, Baba Kalindi E, educator, Brenda Perriman, Mother Abaney, we say inside. And to those not yet born who will come to continue the fight for freedom, dignity, and the acknowledgement of our full humanity, we say Ashe, I. 
Ashe, Ashe, and so it is done. Good morning. I'm Robert Sellers, Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer here at the University of Michigan. Welcome to the 35th Annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day Symposium. It is my honor to host this morning celebration of the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. King. While I wish we were all able to be in our traditional setting of Hill Auditorium, I deeply appreciate your virtual presence this morning. The symposium at the University of Michigan represents one of the largest celebrations of its kind happening anywhere in the country. This year, in addition to today's events, the university will host more than 40 virtual events across campus throughout January and into February. I invite you to participate in as many as possible. This year's MLK Symposium as always was organized by the MLK Planning Committee which is comprised of a group of dedicated students, staff, and faculty from all across our campus. In addition, the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives has provided major administrative support to the planning process. The theme for this year's MLK celebration is, where do we go from here? At the University of Michigan, we're completing our fifth year of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategic while we still have a long way to go to reach our ultimate objectives, I'm very proud of the progress that has been made so far. I'm especially proud of the literally hundreds of new initiatives and programs started throughout our university community that are designed to make us a more just university. One example that I'd like to share with you this morning is a new giving initiative entitled The Raise, Generations of Black Excellence. This new initiative celebrates African-American and Black donors looking to make a meaningful impact on the U of M community. The creation of the race has been led by Ms. Brandy Hudson, as well as several other young African-American U of M alums. This effort is one, one innovative way that the university can include perspectives and voices that have traditionally been less represented. In doing so, I'm sure that the race, through its support of the university, will also provide greater educational opportunities for all our students. I'm very excited about this effort. To Brandy and the other members of the team, thank you for your dedication and generosity. Now it's time for us to move ahead into our program. Our next speaker is Dr. Marques Schlissel, the 14th president of the University of Michigan. During his six and a half years as president, Marcus committed himself in his presidency to make the university of Michigan a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. He believes strongly that DEI must be both a core value as well as a standard operating procedure if the university is to ever meet its full potential and truly become leaders and best. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you President Mark Schlesser. Thank you, Dr. Sellers, for those remarks and the kind introduction. I wanna thank all of you for engaging in the University of Michigan's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium and express my gratitude to all of today's speakers, keynote guests, performers, and organizers. For years, the symposium has provided an important opportunity to reflect on the legacy of Dr. King and to address the vital need for peace and justice here and around the globe. I encourage everyone to participate in the many events we've planned. We present this year's symposium in the context of a global pandemic and during a time of unrest and tragedy. We've seen and felt the health and economic inequities exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the horrifying examples of systemic racism exemplified by the killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and many other Black people by law enforcement. And less than two weeks ago, 
a deadly mob incited by lies and a refusal to accept the results of the presidential election attacked the U.S. Capitol. In the Capitol Rotunda is a bronze bust of Dr. King, unveiled 35 years ago, looking down on what would be a scene of terror rather than an affirmation of the will of the American people. And we're left to lament how he would view such an assault on our liberty and the fundamental values of American democracy, two values he gave his life to uphold. As a public university with a mission to serve society, we must use our intellectual power and commitment to advocacy as instruments to defeat an unjust system, advance anti-racism, and dismantle systems of oppression. We have much more to do before we can begin to realize Dr. King's dream. With these pressing truths in mind, our symposium this year examines the theme, where do we go from here? We do so while understanding that Dr. King's teachings urge us that in order to move forward, we must first go back and rediscover some mighty precious values that we've left behind. We do so in the hope that future generations of students and community members will learn and serve in a place that fully celebrates and welcomes black people and that forever strives to achieve the equality and justice that Dr. King gave his life to enact. We do so as we commit to continuing our work to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion at the University of Michigan. As scholars, educators, and students, we must always remember Dr. King's call for moral leadership. 60 years ago at Spelman College, he said that the proper education will not only give the individual the power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. I wanna thank all of you for ensuring that we never lose sight of the most worthy objectives of peace and justice, for joining together to confront systemic racism and white supremacy, for helping open the doors of opportunity for all, and for working to end the tragic inequities that diminish all of us as humans. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Scott DeRue, the Edward J. Fry Dean of Business in our Stephen M. Ross School of Business. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm Scott Drew, Dean of the Ross School of Business here at the University of Michigan. And it is a true privilege to once again collaborate with President Schlissel, Vice Provost Sellers, and the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives as a co-sponsor of the 2021 annual MLK keynote presentation. This year featuring two inspirational Detroit-based and globally renowned activists that I know all of us are excited to hear from. I wanna thank Rob and the entire team at the Office of Academic and Multicultural Initiatives for the opportunity to co-host this very special event today. Michigan Ross has a long history of supporting programs at the university that honor Dr. King's dream and unite us as a collaborative and academic community committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This year's powerful theme of where do we go from here, I'm sure resonates with all of us as we reflect on everything that we as a nation and we as a global community have gone through in the last year and the impact it has had on all of us. At Michigan Ross, we believe that business is the most powerful force on the planet for positive change, and we are committed to building a better world through business. And it is with our partners across the University of Michigan campus that we aspire to realize this mission. We are educating purpose-driven leaders who will lead change and transform our communities and inspire all of us to create a shared future where everyone has a voice and a future that all of us can be proud of. To be inclusive is at the center of our university's core values that guide how we think and how we act and how we connect with each other. And it's with the entire University of Michigan community. We are working tirelessly to advance a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community here in Ann Arbor and around the globe. And this is important work for all of us as a community of students, faculty, staff, alumni, and partners across the world who continuously strive to make a positive impact 
we have to commit and renew our commitment to listening to each other, renew our commitment to action, and renew our commitment to being part of the change that we aspire to see in the world. I want to thank you for everything that you do in service of this mission. And forever, go blue. Where do we go from here? Commercial, take one. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Really? Dang, I just got here. Wait, let me put it in the GPS. Not literally. Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, so many places. We begin by learning from the past. I'm going where my creativity is celebrated. Honestly, as far away from 2020 as possible. <laughs> See, because of things like that. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. Vaccine me, please. We go to where our presence isn't just tolerated, but appreciated. Kenya, before they close their borders on us. What exactly is here? The pandemic? George Floyd? It's not a destination. It's a journey within myself. Did you hear NASA's building hotels on the moon now? Mm-hmm. That's where I'm going. My spirit ain't feeling this. Trump debt-backed currency? Be specific. I can't work under these conditions. We go where our diverse voices are heard and respected. Where the love isn't circumstantial. Honestly, I am not the expert on exactly where we go from here. But I do know an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So wherever we end up going from here, let's go United. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophie Langerman, a dual master's candidate with the School of Social Work and the School of Environment and Sustainability, the University of Michigan. It is my honor to read the bios of our esteemed guests and welcome them to today's keynote memorial lecture. Dr. Gloria House, named the Kresge Foundation Eminent Artist of 2019, is a poet, essayist, educator, and human rights activist who lives in Detroit. Dr. House completed her bachelor and master's degrees at the University of California, Berkeley in French and comparative literature. Her doctorate in American cultural history was earned at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Before retiring in 2014, Dr. House designed the major in African American and African studies at the University of Michigan, Dearborn, and also served as a director. She is Professor Emerita of Humanities and African American Studies at the University of Michigan Dearborn and Associate Professor Emerita in Interdisciplinary Studies at Wayne State University, where she was a faculty member and advocate for racial equity for 27 years. Dr. House published Home Sweet Sanctuary, Idle Wild Families Celebrate a Century, a Cultural Study of the Historic African American Community in Northern Michigan in 2011. She has published four poetry collections. Blood River, Rain Rituals, Shrines, and Medicine, as well as a book on spatial politics in the United States, Tower and Dungeon, a study of place and power in American culture. Her essays and single poems have appeared in numerous local and national anthologies and periodicals. She is editor of the Naomi Long Magic Poetry Awards series of Broadside Lotus Press, co-editor of the Detroit Periodical, Riverwise and lead editor of the anthology, A Different Image, The Legacy of Broadside Press, which received the Notable Book of Michigan Award from the Library of Michigan in 2005. She's currently an organizer in the Detroit Independent Freedom Schools Movement, the Black Legacy Coalition, and the Coalition for Police Transparency and Accountability. Malik Kenyatta Yakini is co-founder and executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. DBC FSN operates a seven acre urban farm and is spearheading the opening of the Detroit People's Food Co-op, a cooperative grocery store in Detroit's North End. Yakini views the work of DBC FSN as part of the larger movement for building power, self-determination and justice. He is adamantly opposed to the system of white supremacy, capitalism and patriarchy. He has an intense interest in contributing to the development of an international food sovereignty movement that embraces Black communities in the Americas, the Caribbean, and Africa. He is a co-founder of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. The dialogue with House and Yakini will be moderated by UM faculty Stephen Ward. 
Ward is a historian who teaches in the RC Social Theory Practice Program, as well as the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. His teaching and writing focus on two areas of recent American history. One is African-American political thought and social movements, particularly the Black Power Movement of the 1960s and 70s. The other area is the evolution of cities since World War II, with an emphasis on grassroots activism and community-based approaches to urban redevelopment. Much of his work focuses on the city of Detroit. Thank you all so much for your time, and we hope you enjoy. This symposium at the University of Michigan, celebrating the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., an activist of his era, has been around for more than three decades. We've had a range of thought-provoking and powerful speakers who have shaped historical moments and movements. The lectures are typically held in Hill Auditorium, which seats more than 3,000 people. At the famous lectern where Dr. King stood at a visit to campus in 1962, we've heard the words of past keynote memorial lectures, such as Representative Shirley Chisholm, poet Nikki Giovanni, creator of Kwanzaa, Milana Karenga, founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, Morris Dees, journalist and activist Amy Goodman, scholar Lamont Hill, Detroit-based activist, philosopher, and revolutionary Grace Lee Boggs, actor and activist Harry Belafonte, activist Cesar Chavez, and the scholar and activist Angela Davis. Today, we continue in that tradition of activists with local, national, and international impact. We have before us poet, essayist, professor, human rights and community activist, Gloria House, also known as Annette. And we have educator, farmer, food justice advocate, guitarist and leader of the band Molly Wap, Malik Ikumi. Thank you both, Neb and Malik, for joining us here to celebrate and promote the legacy of Dr. King and all those who birthed and continued the civil rights movement of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and of the struggles that have come in its wake. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's all, always a pleasure to be with, with Dr. House. Indeed, indeed. And as our audience will soon get to know, part of the reason why is because she, as well as you, both of you, have been involved in various social movements for decades, challenging a range of economic, racial, and social inequalities and injustices in our society. From criminal justice to education, to racialized police violence, to food justice, and more. As well, you are both artists, and Neb is a poet, Malika musician. With your range of work and artistry, you've taken your whole self to provide holistic commitment to black liberation, to social progress for, this, for the city of Detroit, for this nation and for the world. So let me say thank you for your love and service for bringing about peace and transformation in society that we need. You both embody something beyond nationalism. You represent the action of the verb of community. So I'd like to start by saying thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now we know that we are in this moment of the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the protests on racialized police violence and so much more. Um, and we will speak to the struggles that are taking place now. And you, you both are engaged in many struggles. So I'd like to begin by asking you each if you could take three to five minutes to introduce us to your current work. What are you doing now? Um, what types of things are particularly important to you? And as part of that, if you could characterize the work, tell us how you characterize your work. You characterize it as social justice, as black liberation, or some, some other way. So to begin uh, with an imp, if you could please speak to that. Thank you, Stephen, for a very warm introduction. I'd like to begin by first offering homage to the great man that we're honoring today, Dr. King. One of Dr. King's many legacies to us as social justice advocates is the way he directed our attention past any given moment of, of crisis or hardship to a time when our communities would achieve justice and dignity for everyone. Dr. King courageously pointed out that the US ruling class oppresses citizens at home and people all over the world with its policies of pra and practices of capitalism, militarism, and materialism, greed. 
but he envisioned a time when we will have liberated ourselves from these destructive systems. In his projection of that vision of a new society that we are capable of building, he bequeathed us the spirit of hope and perseverance. And I think this is one of the most important aspects of his legacy. Um, the idea um, that we must be hopeful and that we must always persevere. So I want to say Ashe in the African tradition to Dr. King for that legacy. In answer to the question of, about um, how I became an activist and, and why, I became a political activist and have remained so for almost 60 years because something in me responded to the principle of justice, a sense of what is fair and life affirming. And this sensibility called me into the movements for change. I felt deeply the slogan that we've evolved over the years, no justice, no peace. No peace inside me, if I try to stay on the sidelines as an observer, and a realization that there can be no real peace in a society where there are wide scale injustices. I found camaraderie among thousands of my generation who shared the same feelings and who were determined to resist systems of inequity, abuse, and repression both in this country and abroad. I've worked in numerous arenas over the years from voter registration, freedom schools, political party building during the 60s in the South, to establishing African-centered independent schools, organizing in solidarity with third world independence movements, fighting for inclusion of African and African-American history in the curricula of American universities, speaking out against the wars in Vietnam, in Iraq, uh, developing solidarity for brothers and sisters in Palestine, fighting for equity for African-American faculty, staff and students in the universities where I worked, mobilizing support for political prisoners, creating education programs for prisoners, working to strengthen the ties between various communities of color here in the United States, working with activists from those communities, defending against police violence, that's been an ongoing part of my work over the years, and urging prison abolition. And I'd like to just now express uh, some love to all the organizations that I'm working with right now so that um, as we go into this conversation, people will understand the references I'm making. So I'm working with the Detroit Independent Freedom Schools Movement, the Community Research Collective of We the People of Detroit, the Coalition for Police Transparency and Accountability, Broadside Lotus Press, the Black Legacy Coalition of the Charles H. Wright Museum, Frontline Detroit, East Michigan Environmental Action Council and Cass Commons, the National Council of Elders, and finally, Riverwise Magazine. These organizations are part of a network of hundreds of involved community organizing efforts in Detroit. Their objectives may be broadly categorized as either one, defending against oppressive social policies and agendas, or two, imagining and attempting to create alternatives. We are resisting assaults on our communities, whether it's water shutoffs to families who can't pay exorbitant bills or murderous policemen who function as domestic army against African-Americans and other people of color or the wrecking of our public school system to make way for privatization. Defending, resisting, protecting. The same time that we do this, we are also conceiving and building new institutions. Our work also includes the intellectual effort to disrupt and dislodge the cultural hegemony of capitalism with its class privileges, arrogance, greed, and white supremacy. We are challenging discriminatory ways of thinking 
and the many debilitating racist public narratives about who we are as African-Americans and other people of color. We wanna tell the truth, name the violations that we see in the society around us, unmask the lawlessness and inhumanity of the 1%, engage in the fray of contending ideological frameworks, insisting on honesty as we look at the conditions that are around us. In addition, we're endeavoring to raise consciousness concerning ethical, moral, and spiritual choices that we have to make if we want to advance our human conditions. This aspect of the work has been particularly important during the Trump administration, as we all know, when we've seen outrageous lies being uh, projected into the public discourse. Finally, as social justice advocates, or as people who work for liberation of our communities, we want to counteract the despair that settles over communities when our rights are violated and our representative institutions are circumvented or usurped. That's why we can't remain silent. That's why we do not remain silent. And that's why we will not succumb to a sense of powerlessness. And that's why we per persevere. And, and that is why I wanted to praise Dr. King for leaving us that legacy of perseverance, of hope and perseverance, because it's so important to the work we're doing today. Thank you, Mama Neb. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Dr. House. I'm so used to calling her Mama and Neb, knowing her <laughs> at school movement. Uh, but I'd like to first begin by giving praise to the creators and our ancestors generally, uh, those that African people share collectively and also those within my own bloodline who I continue to draw tremendous inspiration from. And I'd also like to acknowledge and give abundant praise to Dr. King, who was certainly a courageous and fearless warrior. And I have to admit that it really took me time to grow into an, a greater understanding and appreciation of uh, the profundity of Dr. King's philosophy and his actions. Uh, certainly we continue to still be guided by the desire to eliminate what he called the three evil that uh, Aneb just spoke about, racism, economic exploitation, and militarism. And uh, all of those things are tied, as she correctly mentioned, to the, the wretched system of capitalism that continues to oppress people both in this country and throughout the world. And so in many ways, we see our work still as continuing that legacy of bringing about social justice and also uh, I continue to frame my work as being part of the Black Liberation Movement for sure. Uh, so although I've been, been involved in many things over the years, including uh, education, both having taught in Detroit Public Schools and been a co-founder of an independent African-centered school, uh, having done some work with prisons through HOPE, helping our prisoners elevate, uh, both doing work with, to support political prisoners and to transport families to visit uh, prisoners in the state of Michigan um, and other types of justice work. I think the thing that we're realizing now is that all of this work is intersectional right. because all of these problems are really caused by the same root problems capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. And so we frame our work as both being opposed to those things, but uh, being opposed to systems of oppression, as uh, Aneb pointed out correctly, is not enough. We also have to have a vision and have an imagination of what the world can be. And so frankly, the work that I'm doing now is really in that last category, that it focuses primarily on how we can create a food system in which fairness and justice is modeled within that food system. So currently I lead an organization called the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, which does several things in Detroit, including running D-Town Farm, a seven acre farm in a city park. Uh, we lead a youth program called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program, uh, which functions at two sites in Detroit, uh, the Barack Obama Leadership Academy and the Shrine of the Black Madonna. And at one of the sites, in fact, we partner with Detroit Independent Freedom Schools on Saturdays. And so the participants in the Freedom School program are also the participants in the Food Warriors program. So I'm very glad that we're able to 
to have that partnership to strengthen the young people in our community. And then the big project that the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is working on now is a twofold project, really. It's the creation of a cooperative grocery store called the Detroit People's Food Co-op. And also we're building the building that that food co-op will be located in on the corner of Woodward and Euclid, and that building is called the Detroit Food Commons. The Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is also a founding member of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Because of course we know that the problems that we face in Detroit's black community in regards to access to high quality nutrient dense food, the problems that we face in Detroit's African American community with other ethnic groups coming in and extracting the wealth from our communities are not problems that are unique to the city of Detroit. In fact, they're problems that are common to black communities throughout the United States. And in many ways, the problems that we see with lack of access to high quality food are problems that people around the world face as a result of an industrial food system that is controlled by corporate giants who place profit above the well-being of people. And so the primary work that we're involved in now is the work of building black food justice, black food security, and black food sovereignty. And we frame our work in a way that makes it absolutely clear that what we're intending to do is participate in the movement to shift power because that's really the fundamental thing that needs to be done to empower communities so that we can take these visions that we have for the future, make them actually manifest in the physical world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, in some uh, intriguing and powerful ways, you both have spoken to the theme for this year's symposium, which is the title of Dr. King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here? And each of you have spoken a bit about um, the work you're doing now to take us to that new place. And you also spoke a bit about um, how we got there. But of course, because to think about where we want to go, we have to have some sense of beginnings, right? So I'd like to ask you now to each reflect on a bit more on some of your own beginnings as an activist, as a community worker, as various um, things and roles that you are and play as you describe. So I'll begin with Dr. House. Renev, um, part of your trajectory involves being part of an important part of a group called SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could tell us anything that you'd like to offer about how and why you became involved in SNCC and or what you did in SNCC or how you understand the, the moment that SNCC was. And for our audience, we should be clear that SNCC was a major organization of the civil rights movement and of the Black Power Movement. Mm -hmm. So what, um, at this point, what reflections would you offer personally and more broadly about SNCC um, and thinking about where do we go from here? Okay. Um, I have to back up a couple of years before joining SNCC to explain how it is I ended up going to work with SNCC. Um, after I graduated um, from UC Berkeley, I spent a year abroad, um, first in England and then in Paris. And um, while I was in Paris, I had the good fortune to learn about Présence Africaine and, you know, the legacy of Africans and African Americans who had lived in exile in Paris for some years and created this intellectual circle and published a, uh, a book uh, or journal called Présence Africaine, began to understand um, who we are as African people in the diaspora, um, being away from the United States, there in Paris and meeting African students, um, some um, elder Africans who had been living in exile for a while, who introduced me to the, the history that they knew and the history they had lived, um, but also uh, students of my own generation who were studying there in France, but were very much tied to the liberation movements that were going on in their countries on the continent. So they really raised my consciousness about the politics of the world, about international relations. Of course, I had studied, quote, international relations um, in my poli-sci classes at Berkeley, but here I was getting um, new insights about um, the, the role of liberation movements particularly in Africa, 
but around the world. And um, also during that period, um, the Algerian revolution was going on. And so there were real actions happening in Paris um, carried out by, uh, by um, the Algerians um, trying to further their struggle. So I got uh, a different kind of education while I stayed there. And by the time I came home, I was thinking very differently about the United States. I was thinking very differently about who we are as Africans in the United States. And of course, we were uh, involved in a, in a major struggle in the South during that period. And there were things happening, for example, the, the murder of the four little girls in the, in the um, church in Birmingham and the disappearance and kidnapping and murder of the civil rights workers, the SNCC civil, right, civil rights workers. These were things we were reading about and, and grieving wherever we were. But I was back in Berkeley as a graduate student and I decided I didn't want to simply read about that struggle that was going on in the South. And I started to look for an opportunity to go South. Um, a, gr a group of um, students from San Francisco State College um, were organizing a book drive and they were gonna take the books and set up a freedom school in Selma. And I learned about this project and I thought, aha, this is my opportunity to go South and to do something constructive to make some kind of contribution to the movement. So that's how I ended up in Selma, Alabama in the summer of 1965. And um, my brother Stokely Carmichael, who later became Kwame Touré, invited me to come and um, canvas with the SNCC um, project uh, workers in Lowndes County, Alabama. And I started to do that. I do the work of the Freedom School, teaching the children in the mornings, and then we would drive to Lowndes County and I would work with the SNCC staff people um, to canvas the plantations and in, encourage people to register to vote. Um, I ended up being involved in a demonstration. We were arrested, um, jailed for a little over a week. When we came out, one of our co-workers, one was murdered, one was wounded very heavily. Um, went to bury Jonathan Daniels, who was murdered, and then went back to Berkeley thinking, okay, I'll just pick up from where I left off. Um, I had a teaching assignment in the French department, and I thought that I would just go back to do that. But once I was in Berkeley, I knew I didn't want to be there anymore. I went back to Alabama, and I was hired into SNCC at that point. So that was late summer of 1965 that I um, started to work officially as a SNCC field secretary. That's how I came to SNCC. Long story, I guess. I don't know if you wanted to know all that, <laughs> if you wanted me to discuss all that, but that's how SNCC was um, having met uh, the SNCC workers during the summer and worked with them in Lowndes County. I decided that's where I wanted to be and I wanted to engage in that work. Thank you, thank you. No, SNCC <laughs> place uh, and places like Lowndes County, Alabama, and the Lowndes County Freedom Organization um, are of considerable importance in the development of the civil rights movement. Again, the Black Black Power movement. Um, so it's it's useful for us to hear how those are part of your own trajectory. Um, exactly. I suspect we may come back to some other parts of that um, okay. of the trajectory. Right now, I like to add, including uh, how and when you came to Detroit. So speaking of Detroit, I want to ask now the similar question to Malik. Um, I'll preface this question by saying that, um, again, I'm, I'm moving us to Detroit. And in November of 1963 in Detroit, Malcolm X gave one of his two most famous speeches, a speech titled Message to the Grassroots. And I know that that speech, a recording of that speech, plays a role in uh, Malik's trajectory. So Malik, I'd like, Ashley, if you could please share with us your your path, um, the, the beginnings of your path into activism and to thinking about the community work that you have done over these decades in Australia. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'm always amazed when I listen to Anev talk about her history, because in this uncanny way, she's been in all the hot spots of school 
And so I sometimes think that maybe the black struggle, in fact, revolves around a nail. I don't, I'm no, not, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, in, in many ways, I, I would say I'm the beneficiary of Neb and those in her generation, which is slightly over me. Um, and I, I was coming of age in the time period that, that she's speaking about in the mid and late 1960s. And so I was born in 1956. And so in 1967, when Detroit experienced the bloodiest of the rebellions that occurred throughout the United States in the 1960s, I was 11 years old. Mm. So that's really a formative time period. And so that's the time when I'm moving from childhood into the beginnings of adolescence and beginning to shape my ideas about who I was. All of that happened within the context of black struggle. It happened within the context of me seeing uh, tanks driving down the streets in Detroit. Or for example, in 1966, I played Little League Baseball on the on the play field at Central High School. In 1967, it became a military base where the, the US Army was encamped in order to, um, to address the rebellion that was happening in the city of Detroit. But specifically, by 1969, I had started attending post-junior high school. And Detroit had had this history of student activism, but primarily at high schools. There had been a walkout at Northern High School. There had been activity at Northwestern High School, uh, walkouts and protests. There had been protests at some of the high schools on the east side of Detroit at Mumford High School. But for some reason, the junior high school I was at was also a hotbed of black consciousness and black protest. And so, I had two teachers in particular in 1969, Ronald McCombs and Melvin Peters, who were both childhood friends from West, West Virginia. Mm. They were relatively young men at this time. I, I suppose they were uh, 26, 27 years old themselves. And both of them had big, big, huge afros. And so for 13 year olds, first being confronted with the visual of these, uh, of these radical young teachers, um, uh, that was impactful. But then also the two of them sometimes used to combine their classes. McCombs was my social studies teacher. Peters was my English teacher. They would sometimes put their two classes together in the same room and either have a guest speaker or play records for us. And on one occasion, they played the entire LP recording of Malcolm, X, M Malcolm X's message to the grassroots delivered in Detroit. By the way, that spe speech was delivered in some other places before he did it in Detroit. He did it in Cleveland also, but the speech in, in Detroit was recorded by Richard Henry. And so that has become the one that people are most familiar with. But it impacted me in many, many ways. A uh, one as a young uh, boy growing into the beginnings of manhood and trying to figure out what does, you know, what does manhood look like? Uh, this image, of Malcolm, this fearlessness that Malcolm exhibited uh, was very appealing to me. So I think myself and a lot of my other peers, uh, our identification with Malcolm had a lot to do with our own developing idea of what it meant to be a man, a black man in American society. Uh, the other way that it impacted me is of course, Malcolm had this international perspective and he talked about uh, the conditions of black and brown people throughout the world and how it was important that we internationalize our struggle. That also had a profound impact on me. But it had a very personal impact on me as well because he talked about, um, during the time our ancestors were enslaved, he talked about the food that our ancestors ate. And specifically, he said there were two types of slaves, the house slave and the field slave. And he said the house slave ate the, the, the food that was closer to the food that the so-called slave masters ate. And the majority, the field, slaves, uh, the enslaved Africans in the fields, ate those less desirable part, parts of, of, of the animals. And so he, he kind of listed what those parts of the animals were. And he ended by saying, and you ate guts. He said, that's what you were back then, gut eaters. And some of you are still gut eaters now, talking about chitlins. And so this was profoundly impactful on my 13-year-old mind, because up to that point, my very favorite food in the whole world 
was chitlins. And so <laughs> by listening to Malcolm, it started me thinking about food within a political, historical, and cultural context, rather than just thinking about food in terms of how it tasted. And so in a way that set me on the, on the path that I'm currently on, uh, although the initial manifestations of that had to do with changing my own diet, first eliminating pork, then eventually by 1975, as a result of my association with Haki Matabuti and other, uh, what we might call cultural nationalists, I become a vegetarian, and then by 1983, I become what I later found out was called a vegan. Uh, and then several years later, I found out that there was this thing called a food movement, where not only were people looking at their own individual diets, but they were looking at the systemic causes of food insecurity. In fact, I have to say the Black Panther Party and its newspaper had a huge impact on me in that regard of analyzing the root causes of hunger and also addressing the symptoms of hunger through their free breakfast program. So we continue that legacy uh, through the work of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Mm. Thank you. So oh, go ahead. Annette. I was just going to say it's good to know this history, Malik. After all these years, I didn't know this part, right, of your young year, your younger years. Yes. Good to know. Well, well let's, let's, let's uh, pick up on that, continue with that. As we reference, um, it was around the late 60s, I believe, when you came to Detroit. And then 67. Followed, oh, 67. 67. Right. Just in time for the rebellion. So you arrived <laughs> right before the rebellion <laughs> and have been in Detroit since then. Mm -hmm. And so the two of you have been engaged in a range of organizations and movements and struggles um, through much of that time. Do you recall when and how you met? And or is there anything else you could say um, about the, the ways I in which some sort of vague, vague recollections, and Malik, maybe you can tell me if this is right. But I think that I first met you because you came to some of our RNA meetings held in the building where you now have the uh, food co op, the food uh, Detroit Black Community Detroit Black Community Food Security Network office, right? I think in the same building. Chokwe Lumumba had an office, and we often had meet RNA meetings there. And I think maybe you came to some of those meetings. Yeah, I did come to some of those, but I don't think I first met you. Oh, I think okay. At, at the Alexander Crummel Center. Oh, uh, all right. And the Alexander Crummel Center for Worship and Learning was really a black nationalist institution that had these incredible people associated with it. Dr. Gloria House, of course. Mama Imani Humphrey and Mama Inamoy Kapiri Hill, who uh, went on to become two of the key figures in what would become Aisha Shule, uh, kind of the, the forerunner of African education in, 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 Detroit. Uh, in Detroit. Broadside Press was housed at the Alexander Crummel Center. During those days, yes, it was. Yes. I worked with a small group called the All African Liberation Committee. In fact, we kind of the main thing we did was plan African Liberation Day. But we also ran a small food co-op, a buying club out of the Crummel Center. And there were many other activities. So it was this gathering place where all kinds of people were coming. I think that's, that's actually right. the first place I met you. Oh, all right. That's good to know. Yes. You know, uh, at church, but, and Harold yes, McKinney. Yes. Right. Harold McKinney and Gerald McKinney were members. So it was this incredible, incredible place. It was an incredible place. Um, where we combine political and cultural activism with religious services on Sunday. And that is that was the, um, the core, um, the families who were the founders of Aisha Shule, uh, later to become Aisha Du Bois School. Those were, were the uh, founders of, of that school, right? So it came out of the Alexander Fummel Center. Right. So many was, things, yeah. It was initially called the Alexander Fummel School, it was. Morphed into Shule. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So it's been a long time. Golly, that was the mid-70s. That was like 1975. Yep. That was the mid-70s. So, But then Malik and I have worked uh, together um, in the school that he co-founded in Sorma Institute. Um, I was a volunteer teacher of French and English for a few years there and also served as chair of his board for a while. So, and then there've been so many other collaborations over the years. 
Well, this conversation is is making it clear that there's each of you individually and then certainly together so much history um, that you are a part of and you can speak to. So the audience will be able to recognize that this is just touching on um, quite a bit, which means giving us um, some some guideposts, some directions. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For instance, you referenced Harold McKinney, one of the um, really important uh, jazz musicians in Detroit's really illustrious uh, history of jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, the RNA, which stands for the Republic of New Africa, one of the black power organizations had this roots in Detroit. Um, yeah. One of the founders is Milton Henry, who, as Malik referenced, uh, recorded the message to the grassroots speech, along with many other things. So the connections are are many. The, the roots and the struggles are deep. So this is a, a wonderful way to give people a sense of um, those connections and the, and the deep struggles and places to look for more. Mm -hmm. um, I just remembered also, Malik, we're working together in Hope, right? Help our prisoners elevate. You mentioned that, but and you know, ended up uh, doing the work you mentioned of taking people to see their relatives, but also producing something I thought was very valuable, a little handbook that we hoped would would help men. We were working with mostly men prisoners at that point, but would help them uh, adjust to life outside. And the entry, you know, yes. the re the reentry manual, yes. Mm -hmm. And so that organization, HOPE, which is an acronym, as you said, stands for Helping Our Prisoners Elevate, right. was formed in about what? So that was formed in 2000, actually. So in 2000, I opened Black Star Community Bookstore. And as part of the bookstore, I wanted to use the bookstore to send books into prisons. And so initially, HOPE was started as a vehicle to send books into the prisons. And then the, the work morphed into larger prisoner support work and prison reform work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chikor yes, was, one, was one of the members and Yusuf is now a prominent activist in Detroit. Kwame Akwamu was the chair of the organization for some time. Ebony Roberts, uh, who as a result of her work in Hope, met Shaka Senghor, who had, has a best-selling book and Ebony also wrote a best-selling book about her relationship with Shaka. So many really robust, fruitful relationships throughout of Hope as well. That's true. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, um, Stephen, I might mention that before Hope, I had been involved in a program sponsored by Wayne State University um, in which we prepared uh, men at Jackson Maximum Security Prison um, to earn their, their bachelor's degree. So um, I came to Hope having worked in that program for four years and having um, met uh, a young man in that program, um, Ahmed Rahman, uh, whom most people in our community uh, came to know over the years because he graduated from that program. Eventually, uh, we were able to, to win a um, his freedom. And he came out and um, made his way through a doctorate at the University of Michigan. Uh, and also uh, came to work uh, in the history department at U of M Dearborn, but became a very important part of our community here in Detroit. So um, as Malik is saying, many of the people um, whom we supported or helped to, you know, to come out of the prisons ended up making really major contributions to our community. If I can just add a little to that. I actually met Ahmed in 1977 when I was a student at Eastern Michigan University, the Black Student Association used to visit the Black Cultural Society of Jackson Prison that Ahmed was the, the, direct, the leader, leader of. Leader, leader of, mm -hmm. But in fact, at, his, at that time, he was using the name Amilcar. Yes. Um, and I, I later got to know him as, as Ahmed. Ahmed yeah. I worked on the committee to free Ahmed under, under uh, Dr. House's leadership. So, um, go ahead, Stephen. No, no, no. Well, what I'm going to say is going to speak on your behalf. So, all I'm going to say is that perhaps because of time, but also because of modesty, Aneb is not saying that Aneb was a driving force in that committee to free Ahmed Rahman. And the connection. The driving force. Yes. I was there. Yeah. I can tell you about it. Thank you. 
And the, the connections actually could continue because Ahmed had, the reason he was in prison go, was related to his activism um, in the early 70s. He was from Chicago. And then when he came to Detroit, connection with the Panthers. So, um, so again, th those connections are, are uh, plentiful. Mm -hmm. So there's much we can say here, but I want to move on a bit for, the, um, for our audience to get a further sense of the ways in which you're thinking has has evolved. So again, our theme is Dr. King, Dr. King's um, question and, and really challenge us, where do we go from here? Um, and part of that is about how change happens. You've been talking about understanding the history of, of struggles to make change. Another part of that is theories of change or understandings of how we have a sense of how to, how to change our society, how to change the world. So I'd like to ask each of you, again, this is, a large question. So just give us a sense of how you reflect on your and your understandings of black liberation, of social movements, of revolutionary change, how they have grown or evolved through the course of your decades of activism and community work. And I will invite um, either of you to go first. Maybe respond to each other as well. Go ahead, Malik, this time. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll say, I think over the years, one, I have developed a greater appreciation of the fact that this, this is a long-term struggle. John Oliver Killen said once that we need long distance runners. And, you know, we, we're pretty good at sprinting. You know, something happens and we, you know, we, 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 we're up in arms, we protest, but then typically after a few weeks that kind of dies out and the system continues to move on. And so I guess I've developed a greater appreciation that really this is a lifetime's struggle, that not only do we have to dedicate our lives to it, it's not something you get in for six months, a year, two years, five years, you make a lifetime commitment, but also it's an intergenerational struggle that to use a football analogy, we carry the ball down the field as far as we can, and then we hand it off to others who hopefully can build on what we have done prior and move closer to, to the goal. Uh, so I've definitely developed that, a greater understanding of that. I've developed a greater understanding of perhaps the resiliency of the system that we're fighting against. Uh, at one point in my younger development as an activist, you know, I thought that in 1969, I thought in the next two or three years, the revolution was going down. <laughs> black people will be free and uh it's it's uh 2021 and of course we're still fundamentally in the same situation so i've developed a greater understanding for that but also i've developed i think a greater understanding for how human consciousness evolves and it, it does you know, we're not we don't see the world in the same way that we saw the world in 1966. we see it in in, in generally humanity has evolved, I think, to see things in a more advanced way. Some of the notions that we had in the, you know, or the 70s, we would probably think to be ridiculous now. Uh, so, so I've kind of seen how, how that evolution takes place. In fact, uh, uh, Stephen, your teacher perhaps speaks to this idea I'm speaking of, that it's both a question of making revolution, but it's also the question of the evolution of human consciousness and the evolution of society. And then finally, I think I have, grown over the last several years as a result of my uh, affiliation with younger activists to understand the need for self-care. So the work ethic when I got involved in the movement was that you put your nose to the grindstone and you keep it there 24 seven and <laughs> right. you are a traitor to people. <laughs> right. And then I started meeting younger activists uh, who, you know, in some of the fellowships I was in, they were talking about going scuba diving and taking vacations. And I was like, what? Revolutionaries can, can do that? I didn't know. And so, uh, you know, not that, we, not that we get lax in our commitment to, to, the, to the movement, but we have to approach it in a way that al allows us to remain in it for decades and for a lifetime. And so a that balance requires us to prioritize self-care at the same time that we're prioritizing the transformation of society. Mm -hmm. So I can't say much more, add much more to that, um, Malik, um, thinking along the same lines. And you're right, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was 
such a sense of urgency about everything, right? That we were going to make it happen right then, right? And we worked around the clock, right? Um, just sort of ran ourselves into the ground trying to make change. And I think, yes, as, as we got older, we realized, well, if you're going to be doing this work for a while, you're gonna to have to figure out another way to be more balanced about it. And it's something that I share with younger activists, please pay attention to your own health. Yeah. Um, when we had the 50th uh, SNCC anniversary, I was saddened by how many of us were suffering with chronic illnesses and you know dealing with really major health issues and a lot of that had to do with the very stressed lives that we lived for 20 or 30 years. So I always make it a point to tell young activists, be careful, um, try to achieve a balance in terms of work, play, rest, et cetera, and um, paying attention to diet and all of those things. Um, I think as I've matured in the struggle, I've, I've realized the significance of um, checking in on our, on our history, uh, looking back uh, to our predecessors, rereading Malcolm, rereading uh, Frantz Fanon, rereading Aimé Césaire, uh, rediscovering all the lessons that they taught us when we were youngsters, but um, just rerouting, rerouting ourselves in the lessons that we learn from people who have been on this journey of revolutionary struggle before us. Um, and trying to, I think this has been uh, an emphasis in the lives of some social justice activists of the last two decades or so, to try to find ways to integrate um, the spirituality uh, that we've cultivated into our political work. Um, bringing in certain aspects of ritual and ceremony, uh, empowering rituals and ceremonies into the political work. In Detroit, I saw that happen in a, in a really um, important way um, when one of our social justice advocates, um, Charity, um, was struck in New York and was in a coma for several days. And um, a couple of our spiritual leaders in the Detroit movement convened a ceremony at which uh, we all prayed together for Charity's well-being. Unfortunately, she passed away, but it was a very important moment in Detroit movement circles. It was the first time that I know of where activists convened a circle specifically to do spiritual ceremonial ritual work on behalf of a comrade in the movement. And I think I'm seeing more and more of that happen, uh, particularly as we move to do collaborations with the indigenous communities. I think it's very important. Um, what else? Well, I'll stop there for the moment. Yeah. Um, well, let me just add, um, in the 60s and 70s, of course, we were deeply involved in our own consciousness raising, in our own um, strengthening of our identity, our roots in Africa, uh, the movement for black consciousness and black power. Um, and we were also beginning to understand the ways in which um, we, the lives that we lived in, in this society were very colonized lives, very much like the lives that our brothers and sisters who were colonized abroad were living. We didn't have control of the major institutions in our communities. We were heavily policed, we were brutalized, we were subjected to violence by the police. Um, we weren't in control of our schools or housing or whatever. So we began to make those connections and to identify with uh, third world countries, with liberation movements. I think that was really important because it was the beginning of our internationalization of consciousness to begin to see ourselves as Africans in this country on the world stage and very much tied to uh, brothers and sisters around the world, no matter where they were, whether it was Nicaragua or Cuba or Palestine 
or one of the African countries. So um, those were important aspects of, of our development as people in the liberation struggle or as social justice advocates. I'll stop there. I don't want I don't want to ramble. I was trying to just touch on some of the things that were important as I developed or matured in the movement. Well, thank you very much. That gives us a sense of, of that development. And again, recognizing there's so much more that could be said. As we come to the end of our, our time together, I think you both have oh ended. Oh my goodness. It's yeah. already yeah. end. <laughs> Unfortunately, our time has, has come to an end. But you've given us, and particularly with the way you ended with much to think about for people to continue to think about their own growth. We have one more treat, audience. We are gonna end with a poem by Dr. House, Aneb, to take us home. Thank you, Stephen. So this poem was written in 2017 and um, it was um, an effort to say what it has meant to be in this web of relationships with other uh, brothers and sisters in the liberation movement, uh, working as a political activist, and um, yeah, what it means to be a part of the freedom struggle. It's entitled, uh, and it's uh, it's in my latest book, Medicine. It's entitled "For You, This Circle." this circle of family, friends, comrades, co-workers, teachers, students. You, this circle, welcomed me, permitted me to speak to you and for you, urged me to propose, to imagine, to teach, to dream. You, mm -hmm. this circle, envisioning a new world, pulled me into your embrace and carried me forward. You forgave my frequent failures. You nodded in understanding. You called on me for help, which made me strong. You then applauded my strength as if it had not been you who engendered it in me. You polished the gifts I brought. You and I are call and response, river and sea, flint and fire, daffodil and spring each other's promise of what is good and beautiful, each other's reason for being. Arm in arm, knit together in that vast invisible lace that is called love, we pursue the world of justice already awake and waiting in our souls. You honor me with praise, I salute you with gratitude and thanksgiving. Thank you so much for that poem, which closes our circle. Um, I wanna thank both of you for sharing with us um, your, your passion as activists, your sensitivity as artists, your insights as scholars. We are all enriched by what you've shared with us today and all the work you do more broadly. So thank you to each of you. Thank you to thank the audience. You. Thank you for having us. Thank you. For decades, Black Americans have been mistreated and underrepresented by the medical and scientific communities. As a result, there is a deep lack of trust. But we must and we will do better. One of the wrongs we can right is to stop the damage being done by the COVID-19 pandemic. The disproportionate number of Black lives that this virus has taken. As a Black surgeon, a father, a student, a mother, and a person with a disability. My message to you is, do not let our communities miss out of the full benefit of the COVID-19 vaccine. The vaccines have met rigorous safety standards set by the FDA. And they are effective at blocking disease caused by COVID-19. The COVID-19 vaccines are for every one of us. Our communities deserve this breakthrough. You can help save lives and make sure our communities benefit from the protections of these vaccines. Every shot counts.
Good morning. I'm Susan Collins, the provost of the University of Michigan. First, a heartfelt thank you to Gloria House and Malik Yakini for their very thoughtful contributions to our program today. Our theme this year grows from Dr. King's book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Written in 1967, the book addresses a society with deep divisions between people and great uncertainty about the future, themes that certainly resonate today. Dr. King argued for creating community, believing that to address societal problems, people need to come together, gain understanding of one another, and take the steps that lead to a society free from the prejudices of the past. Today, we face complex challenges, including systemic racism, accelerating climate change, and a pandemic that has laid bare the inequities in our society. As in 1967, we face a stark choice. The way forward is, as Dr. King urged, to strengthen our community by deepening our understanding of racism and inequities, and by using that understanding to develop new levers for change. The university is committed to this and has launched several anti-racism initiatives. We're home to faculty whose work on racism and their ways to address it is pathbreaking and impactful. We've launched a hiring initiative that will bring more anti-racism scholars to campus, helping to develop both the historical understanding and the avenues for change that our society so urgently needs. We've also established the George Floyd Memorial Scholarship Fund, and we're strengthening the anti-racism training that we provide. These are important steps, but it's also critical for each of us to take individual actions. Dr. King recognized many ways in which individuals can contribute to the movement towards community. These include education to learn about injustice and racism, conversation with others to develop shared understandings of the challenges that we face, and making a personal commitment to act for justice. I hope that each of us will recommit ourselves to learning and to action that will help our society overcome racism and injustice. Together as a community, we can advance Dr. King's vision. I'd like to thank all of you again for joining us today. As host, I have the honor of closing out today's program. I hope that you've been as enriched and inspired by today's program as I have been. The theme for this year's MLK Symposium, Where Do We Go From Here?, is quite appropriate to the current times. 2020 has been one of the most challenging years in recent memory. We've endured a global pandemic, a racial reckoning, as well as the most divisive presidential campaign and election in recent memory. All of these events have laid bare the many societal inequities that Dr. King preached about and wrote about and marched and sacrificed his life to illuminate and to eliminate more than 50 years ago. We as a nation are clearly at a crossroads. We must decide where to go from here. The events of the first week in 2021 provide in stark relief two very different paths that we can choose to pursue. One path that we can choose to pursue is the example of the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. While still another example of a path that we can take is the senatorial elections in Georgia that concluded the day before. The difference that I wanna point out about these two paths has nothing to do with their political affiliation. In reality, the two events had a lot in common with each other. Both events were represented, both events represented movements of individuals whose actions were completely motivated by their sincere belief that they were robbed of their voting power by their government. Both movements had reached a tipping point where they felt like something had to be done now at this moment to right this injustice. Both movements were highly charged emotionally and that emotion was fueled by social media. However, there were really important differences as well. And these differences has everything to do with the emotions and worldview that underlay these two movements. The riot at the Capitol 
was actually the culmination of a year-long campaign by their leader that said that the only way that he could lose the election was if they were cheated. Since the leader lost the election, the argument was they must have been cheated, even if that argument was undocumented. The focus in this case was on a personal grievance based on a sense of entitlement. In contrast, the movement in Georgia was based on a centuries long belief handed down from generation to generation that the only way that they could win the election was if they overcame the documented systemic efforts to suppress their vote. And the only way to do that would be through grassroots organizing, legal strategizing, perseverance, and just plain hard work. The focus was on what could be achieved in the face of overwhelming opposition with hope and dedication, a belief that the system, no matter how faulty, is redeemable. As a country and a university, there's a lot to learn from what happened in Georgia. First, we must have faith that we can make a difference, that our efforts actually matter. Second, we must build on the strong foundation that were laid before us by those agents of change who came before us and did their work. Third, we must empower and include the voices and perspectives of our younger generation to find new ways to do old things. If we do these things, if we learn these lessons, I'm confident that we can meet the challenges that face us both as a nation and as a university community. Now, before I go, I wanna also take a moment to address specifically the African-American community and other communities of color. I wanna urge you to consider getting vaccinated against COVID. While the historical reasons for our communities to be less tr trustful of the medical establishment, please avail yourself of all the information, in particular the facts that you need in order to help make an informed decision. Our communities are being disproportionately ravished by the disease, and we need to do whatever we can to protect our loved ones and ourselves. Personally, I plan to get a shot as soon as I'm able. Now, thank you all for participating in this year's MLK Virtual Symposium. I wish you and yours safety, health, and prosperity until we meet again. Take care.